Hi, my name is Tanya Costa. I run Canine Wellness Center in Toronto. Today's video is on what to do with your dog the first two weeks post-op. I'm offering this for free because I know many of you are going through uh, surgery for your dog's knee and just don't know what to do for the first two weeks. I want to um, go through with you what you can do, what you shouldn't do, some games you can play, and just make sure that your dog is game ready for when we're back out on the parks. So, the first thing you want to do when you bring your dog home, as you all know, you'll have some stitches and it looks a little bit scary. So the first thing you want to do with your dog is something I call tickle toes and rub thigh. So tickle toes, rub thigh. And what this looks like is we want to take our dog and we want to make sure that we keep the, the joint moving um, so as that they're not keeping it straight and then all the muscles start to atrophy. So many of you will probably read online, it says uh, online, it says uh, something to the effect of prom or passive range of motion, um, or some vets will even tell you to do this bicycling thing. I don't recommend the bicycling thing and I'll show you why in a second. Come here. We're going to give Drake a little treat. Come here, Jakey. Come on. Good boy. You lie down. Good. What a good boy. Oopsie. Drop the treat. So what we're going to do is we're going to swing him, swing him around. Good boy. He just got back from the park, so I apologize. He's a little bit wet. So what you're going to do for tickle toes and rub thigh is you're going to put your finger in here, and what will happen is the reflex will make him bend the knee and the hip. And then what you do is you rub here. Oh, yeah. So tickle tickle the belly or some dogs have to be here, some is here, and then you go tickle, and then we go rub thigh, oh yeah, times 10. And that's tickle toes, rub thigh. You can do that once a day, and that will help keep the, as I said, the muscles from atrophying, and as well keep the joint nicely lubricated. So you stay there. So the other thing um, we wanna do is when you first come back from surgery, you want to use ice. So you use ice for the first 48 hours. See, ice for first 48 hours. And you want to use the ice to help reduce the inflammation from the surgery. So what you're going to do is take an ice pack out from the freezer. And you're just going to apply it. What a good boy you are. You're being a very good, very good boy. And you're just going to, let's say this is the surgery knee, you're going to just take the ice pack and just wrap it around the knee and just hold it there for about 10 minutes. You don't need to do any more than that. You can do that a couple of times a day and that just keeps um, the inflammation down and it'll also feel really good for them because the first couple of days are a little bit difficult. After the first couple of days, you want to move from, you want to move from the cold to moist heat and what moist heat does is improve circulation and this can be done after the first 48 hours. So what that looks like is you take your gel pack and make sure you have one that can be hot or cold and you take your gel pack you heat it up in the microwave. Now every microwave is different so you just have to judge it. I usually get owners like if you've ever had children and you put it on your inside of your wrist. If it's too hot for you, it'll be too hot for your dog. And then what you do is you take a hand towel, you wet it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be hot water, then wring it out. And then you take your hot gel pack, you wrap it like this, and then you do the same thing. So you take it, oh, good boy, and put it around their knee. And you can put it here, you know, just getting all the blood flowing to the joint, keeping everything lubricated, um, and also it'll probably feel good. And you can not just do it there, you can do it up on their back if you have an older dog, anywhere. Um, and again, you can do that. I generally say do it in the evenings because evenings is when the dog is more relaxed. Can you sit? Good boy. Um, so the other thing we want to do is uh, we want to do some, if you want to do some light massage. What that looks like 
is just gently rubbing the leg. You can take your hands. Don't use your fingers. With massage, dogs don't, especially after surgery. They're not going to like you doing this massage kind of thing. So you want to take this part of your hand and then you're just going to lightly, you can just rub this way. This will be all shaved when you've had surgery. So you just rub up this way and what that does is get the fluid moving upwards. If you rub downwards, what can happen, and I have seen happen, is if there's some inflammation in there or fluid, the fluid will drop down and you'll get this big fluidy thing down here. So you want to move up towards the lymph and have it move through the body and away from where the surgery was. So again, you're just rubbing the leg nicely. And I like to keep one hand on the dog when I'm doing it. And this will also help you um, as time goes on to know if something is not quite right, which we'll get to at the, near the end of the video. But by rubbing this and feeling it every day, you'll know, oh, something feels different. And don't be afraid. You know, you might not want to be doing that right over the surgery site. You can do it around. You can do both sides. Oh, good boy. Yeah, see, he wants to... That's a good boy. Stay. So that's some gentle massage, and you can do that whenever you want. You don't need to do it for an hour or anything like that. Half an hour, 20 minutes, that's all good. Um, so in terms of exercises, you know, I hear over and over again, you've been told complete rest. You're not allowed to do anything. In the human world, we know that someone who has hip surgery, they don't tell someone to lie in bed for two weeks and not do anything because we know that by doing nothing, we're getting muscle atrophy. It doesn't help with the healing. And as well, bone heals quicker if we have a little bit of weight on it. So what we want to do is um, make sure that we are doing some uh, short walks for bathroom only with a sling and a leash. So short walks out to the bathroom with a sling. So if you don't have a sling, you can make one out of a bag. And if anyone wants to know how, I have a video on that as well. But basically, you're going to make sure you use a sling underneath your dog's belly or you can use a leash. And the reason for that is not to lift them up in the air to not put weight on the leg. It's because if they see a squirrel or your neighbor's dog happens to run along the fence, you don't want your dog doing anything that's going to ruin that surgery. So it's just an ounce of protection. Uh, if you have a male dog, a little bit more difficult. Obviously, when he has to go to the bathroom, you're going to have to remove the sling. But um, this is just an ounce of prevention um, in the early time of the surgery. So the other thing that we're going to do is weight shifting. So what does that look like, weight shifting? And why do we do weight shifting? Weight shifting is just if, I, if it was me, I'd just be going side to side, just very gently. Again, nothing explosive. And we're just going side to side to start to engage the muscles a little bit. So what that would look like is we take the sling. Come here, Jake. Bill's good boy. And we put the sling underneath. And then you can either, come here. Come here. Good boy. Okay, he's not playing this game with me. So we'll take the treat. Good boy, good boy. So basically, we take the sling. You can, you can do a little side to side, or you can take a treat if they're a little less motivated to go side to side. Here, you. And just go a little bit this way and a little bit that way. And what you'll notice when you do this is the toes of the affected leg, the leg that's had the surgery, will start to spread open a little bit. And that tells you that they're putting a little bit of weight on it. And again, this is nothing that's going to hurt the dog or ruin the surgery. It's going to help the surgery. So that's weight shifting. Um, so that's week one. When we get to week two, we can start doing a little bit more. As you've probably been told with this surgery, it takes about eight to 10 weeks for it to fully heal. Um, and so week two, we want to add a little bit more to the picture. So what you can do at home, I have, um, equipment here that I sell, or you can use a pillow, enter a pillow. But basically what you want to do is have your dog 
put their front feet up onto a surface. Good boy. And you're going to bring the treat forward. And it, only about two inches, a bit back and a bit forward and a bit back for about 10 seconds. Then you can let them off and then you can put them back on forward, backwards, forward. If you have a dog that's kind of grabby with the treats, what I would recommend is either filling a Kong um, with some yogurt is probably the best thing because you don't want them to get fat while they're not exercising much. Um, freeze it and then you use your Kong and just use that and get them to follow it. Or some people have used a spoon with something on it and freeze it again. The reason you freeze it is mainly because the liquidy they can't just lick it off in one lick and then you got to go refill it. If it's frozen, they actually lick it like an ice cream cone. So that's um, more what we call active weight shifting. And we want to do that again to start um, adding a little bit more to that joint. And we have the front feet on because when their front feet are higher than their back feet, they're leaning towards the back just a little bit more. So that's weight shifting on a pillow or on exercise equipment. And you don't want to do it on anything too high, nothing more than an inch or two. If you have a really little dog, obviously you're going to use something that might be half an inch. Um, in week two, we want to start increasing the walks <clears throat> with a sling. So when you're walking your dog, use your sling and you can increase the walks from, from your backyard um, to the pavement outside. Um, the reason I get people to do that is because over the years I've learned that sometimes people don't use leashes in their backyard or they have a really small black backyard. Um, but the other part of that is inevitably most dogs will want to go after a squirrel. And I've heard so many times people come in and say, oh my gosh, my dog ran after a squirrel and is his knee okay? I find if you go out to the front of your house and walk on the flat pavement, number one, you're going to have a leash on them and also you'll have your sling on them. But number two is your dog can smell other people's mail. I mean, how boring is it to go outside for five minutes every day for eight weeks? Really boring. So if you go outside, they can smell a little bit and they kind of forget about their leg. They might use it a little bit more. So I just find that that's a better thing to do. And typically what we want to do is increase the walks by five minutes per week. But that's all subject to how your dog is doing. So anyway, that's further on it for any of you that want to contact me and we can discuss a, a specific treatment plan for your dog that has had surgery. Um, the other uh, exercise that we can start doing is lifting the paw on the opposite front leg. So in Jake's case, if I, if he had surgery on his uh, left back leg, so left back leg, what I want to do is lift, there you go, you want to lift his front paw, good boy, and I don't, I'm going to move him a little closer and show you that again, because what I want you to see is what happens when I lift that foot is he will shift back onto the opposite back leg. And when he shifts back to the opposite back leg, which is the surgery leg, he's putting just a little bit more weight on it, which again is going to help that with that bone healing. So let me just restock with some more treats. Apparently he's a treat dog. So watch his back leg. So when I lift, he starts to go back on that, that other leg. Let's do that again. Good, good. And if he, if your dog doesn't, just tip it, just kind of on a diagonal, push him a little bit back towards that leg. And you want to do about five repetitions of that. And you can do that a few times a day. It's not something that's going to be injurious to your dog. Um, so uh, that is um, active weight shifting, uh, whereby we're lifting the opposite leg and we're getting them to go onto that affected leg. So those are some of the things that you can do um, the first two weeks. The first two weeks are really, really important. Your dog is getting over the surgery. So you, there's not a lot of things that you can do um, exercise Why Those come in sort of week three to eight. Um, what not to do? 
Do not let your dog jump on anything. Do not let them run. There's no playing with other dogs, no chasing squirrels, and bicycling. Uh, don't quite know why I put it there, but anyway. Bicycling the leg. This is something that I hear pretty much every person that comes to me says they were told to bicycle the leg, the effective leg. And what bicycling of the leg looks like, and what I don't want you to do, come here, is bicycling of the leg. Mainly because I've seen over the years that when you do it, the dogs don't like it. And I've heard of owners talking about how their dog growls at them and all sorts of stuff. So basically what bicycling is, is like they were on a bicycle. And I have owners come in with a death grip and doing this whole thing, which is what they saw online or a vet told them to do or whoever told them to do it. Don't do it. That's just my advice. Um, and the reason you don't want them doing any of those things, running, jumping, playing, is because the bone has not healed yet. It is effectively with a TPLO surgery, you have, um, let me just show you actually, for those of you who are interested. So basically what happens is in the surgery, and I probably should have said this at the beginning, but anyway, here we are. They have a similar, something similar to this. And basically what they have done is cut the bone change the angle of the joint and because the bro bone is broken they have to put a plate on it to stop that bone from flopping in the wind so to speak. So the reason you don't want to do any explosive movements is because we don't want any of the, the screws that are in there or I've seen in some cases um, the plate break with bigger dogs but we don't want any of those to migrate, come out, break because then you're going to have to go back in and have it repaired. And the last thing you want to do after you've spent $5,000 on surgery is have to go back and do it again. Um, when to worry. So one of the things I said earlier was about feeling your dog doing that light touch massage on the dog's leg. If you do that, you will know if there's an issue. So some of the things that you you want to look out for and may want to think about or worry about is when that surgery site um, feels hot to the touch or it's swollen, it's squishy, or you, you put your finger into it and then the, the indentation from your finger uh, doesn't come pop right back out. So if the surgery site feels hot or swollen, um, monitor it. Um, but if it lasts over a day, I would definitely talk to your veterinarian about um, possibly looking at, you know, reasons why that's happening. Um, another thing to look at is if your dog is using the leg well, and then all of a sudden he's not using it, he's holding it up, doesn't want to put it down at all, that might tell you that something might be going on. What I would suggest is, as I said before, keep feeling the leg, feeling around just gently. And so then you can feel maybe something has happened that you're not aware of. Um, the other thing to worry about is if you see some oozing or bright redness around the surgery site. Um, that's definitely a reason to go to your veterinarian. So the last thing I want to talk about is games you can play. So the worst part is, is your dog is stuck at home, kind of like we are right now with COVID-19. Um, and <clears throat> there's you want to give them games, things that occupy their brain and can make them tired. I have two Border Collies and I play these games with them when it's yucky weather outside. So one of the things that um, you can do is play with a tricky treat ball, the big round ball and you put their kibble in it. If you're using one of those and you're putting kibble in, Make sure that when you feed them their dinner, you, you don't feed them their normal dinner amount. Take what would be part of their dinner and put it in the tricky treat ball. And basically they roll it around, not the entire house. I would section off your living room or dining room or an area that's, you know, contained and let them, you know, forage for their food out of the tricky treat ball. Um, the other game you can play is a game I call Find It. So if I have, let's say, we take a treat and how you teach this game, find it, is we take, well, this is a bad example, but you can use a cup or Tim Horton's cup or rubber, 
Rubbermaid bin or whatever you want. Anyway, what happens is, is you put it on the floor. Come here, up and sit, <coughs> sit, stay. And you put it on the floor and you cover it. And then you say, find it, find it. Where is it? Where is it? Find it, find it. Unfortunately, we play this game and I, it's a lot harder normally. And if they can't find it and they're looking around, help them out. Where is it? Find it. Jay, find it. Find it. Find it. Oh, see? And I just, you can just tap on the cup or whatever you're using and just let them know that that's where it is. So what I do with my guys in bad weather is I hide it around the whole house, down in the basement, upstairs, and then they have to hunt around and find the treats. Just an FYI, cut... Uh, or sorry, make sure you count the number of treats that you put out because I can't tell you how many times I've found random pieces of rotten chicken that I forgot about and they never found. But anyway, so yeah, Find It is a great game. Or for those of you that know about snuffle mats, um, there are little mats that have like long pieces of fabric and you can hide the treats into the snuffle mat and then they kind of forage around trying to get at the treats. Those are just a few things that you can do to keep the, their brains going and help tire them out a little bit. Because if you have a border collie that's just had knee surgery, you're going to want to be doing something um, to keep them occupied. So I hope you enjoyed this information um, and that it helps you with your dog postoperatively following cruciate ligament. Um, this is the time of year for me, or most rehab people I think, um, between I would say the beginning of March until mm, probably late May is cruciate ligament season. I, you know, already, even though most things are closed down with the current situation here or everywhere, actually, um, I've been getting two or three phone calls a week asking what they can do. And obviously, you know, it's hard to go out and see people at this time. Um, so uh, this is the time of year for cruciate ligaments. So take care, everybody. I'm glad you were able to join me. If you have any questions, comments, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can reach me uh, by email at A-P-P-T at canine wellness, C-A-N-I-N-E wellness, W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S dot -S com. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.